um, I, I'll get started. Uh, so in this talk, we'll be, uh, we'll be focusing on embodied agents that uh, perceive the physical world and acts according to its understanding of the world in order to solve a particular task. For example, a manipulation robot can perceive visual pixels through its camera and execute raw motor commands to pick up objects in the environment. And other examples are a self-driving robot that learns to navigate around obstacles, or even a web navigation agent that learns to browse the web. There are uh, many other applications in the real world that involve high dimensional states and actions and complex environment dynamics, which make them challenging tasks for RL to solve. How should we train generalist agents that can quickly solve a wide variety of tasks? The common approach in RL is to first manually design reward functions and then train RL on these tasks. However, one of the biggest challenges in RL is that designing a good reward function is difficult, especially in high dimensional problems. What are other ways to supervise an RL agent? Instead of relying on reward functions, we can also learn to imitate some expert behavior from demonstrations. These demos consist of trajectories performed by an expert policy, and they can be obtained from various sources, such as motion capture data, teleoperation, or kinesthetic demos. Then we can run imitation learning algorithms to learn a policy that matches the expert behavior. One open question is, how can we explore and extrapolate beyond the expert demonstrations? One caveat is that the demos are often expensive to acquire, so we often have limited data that does not cover the whole trajectory space. In addition, the expert policy may not be optimal, so we need a way to learn to do even better than humans. Um, yeah, uh, so rather than relying completely on human supervision, can the agent learn on its own by interacting with the environment? In the absence of dense rewards, uh, having a good exploration policy is often critical in RL. Here's a typical learning curve when you train with very sparse rewards. Most time is spent on exploration, but once we find a goal, RL can solve the task pretty quickly. To tackle the problem of exploration in high dimensional settings, there has been many advances in self-supervised RL methods. Uh, one class of such methods automatically learn an intrinsic reward function from interacting with the environment, encouraging the agent to explore. For example, predictive error exploration encourages the agent to explore new and unseen states by learning a predictive model F, whose error is used as an intrinsic reward to encourage exploration towards less familiar states. Here's a video of a navigation agent that is rewarded for visiting new states in the maze environment. One challenge is the noisy TV problem where if the maze has a TV setup, the agent would be attracted and stop moving in the maze. Uh, within self-supervised RL, there are other classes of methods such as mutual, mutual information objectives and goal-conditioned RL. While these methods can learn without a reward function, there are several open challenges. Uh, one is that they are sample inefficient and prone to underfitting, especially in large high dimensional search spaces. It's also difficult to incorporate domain knowledge into the learning algorithm. And it's also unclear how to quantify what is good exploration as that can depend on the domain and the task. So far, I've briefly described self-supervised and human-supervised RL methods, which have their strengths and weaknesses. Can we find a balance in between? The theme of this talk will focus on how we can scalably supervise RL agents. And throughout the talk, we will be mindful about the cost of human supervision and show that there are scalable modalities of supervision that can benefit exploration and representation learning for RL. Uh, here's the outline of this talk. In part one, our focus will be on how we can measure, understand, and amortize exploration. We want to understand what previous exploration methods are doing and why they work. Then in part two, we will look at how we can learn a better representation for exploration. Uh, we'll start with part one. How can we measure what is good exploration? We consider the state marginal matching objective as a way to quantify this. 
This objective tries to match the blue and orange distributions where the blue histogram is the state's marginal distribution and the orange line is a fixed target distribution P star. The objective measures how often the policy visits the states that are considered good under the target distribution. We note that this objective is different from standard RL, which does not match state marginals, but instead the RL objective produces a policy that goes to the mode of the target distribution. Uh, in our paper, we uh, provide a practical algorithm for optimizing this objective, and we also show connections to predictive error expiration and mutual information objectives and user analysis of state marginal matching in order to uh, provide a new perspective on these prior work and understand these methods better. Uh, how can a state marginal matching policy help us amortize the cost of learning to explore? Since the policy is trained to visit a wide range of states, it can be used to do exploration for many tasks in a multitask setting. Uh, let's consider a robotic manipulation task and let's assume the target distribution of the black, bl uh, black, uh, the black object position is uniform over the table surface. Reinforcement learning would uh, converge to a policy that goes to the mode of the target distribution. And uh, in contrast, uh, a straight marginal matching policy uh, converges to a more stochastic exploratory behavior. Um, if, uh, if we measure the state entropy of the policies after training, the state marginal matching policy explores more than the baselines I'd, as indicated by the larger entropy. And we also found that having a policy that tries to maximize entropy and visit many different states is a good exploration prior for solving downstream tasks and leads to faster adaptation and um, a faster uh, and a higher success rate on, at test time. We also ran experiments on a real robot with nine degrees of freedom, and again found that the state entropy reward helps the policy obtain a wider coverage of states, even in real world settings. Uh, we know that adversarial objectives often lead to learning of reward function that is non-stationary. This includes SMM, predictive error exploration, and adversarial imitation learning. In other words, the reward function evolves over the course of training the two-player game between the reward and the policy. But after convergence, you cannot use the learned reward function again to train another policy, a policy from scratch. Uh, it seems wasteful to have to throw away this learned reward function. So can we th instead distill exploration into a single stationary reward function? Importantly, we want this to be a reward function such that if we apply an off-the-shelf RL algorithm on it, it will converge to a good exploration policy. In a follow-up work, we proposed a method called FIRL to learn a stationary reward function for exploration. Uh, first, we write out the state marginal matching objective using the maximum entropy RL framework where theta is the reward parameter. Then our method learns a reward function by doing gradient descent on this objective. Uh, in our paper, we derived the analytical gradient with respect to the reward parameters theta, and this algorithm will learn a stationary reward function that, such that the optimal RL policy for this reward will match the target distribution. Here's an example on the ant locomotion task. Uh, given trajectories from the ant expert, our algorithm outputs both a policy that imitates the expert state distribution and a stationary reward function. Then we tried using the learned reward to train a disabled ant with two of its legs disabled and shrunk. We found that the learned reward function enables the agent to learn to move forward, but with uh, just the remaining two legs. In other words, the learned reward can be used for uh, transfer learning across changing dynamics. And uh, as another use case, uh, it can also be used for relabeling or evaluating offline trajectories. I want to bring up a catch-22 situation between exploration and representation learning. First, efficient exploration requires knowing a good low-dimensional state representation. But on the other hand, learning a good state representation requires data collected from efficient exploration. So, this, uh, so many exploration algorithms are limited by the quality of the state representation. And this brings us to the next section, on learning a better representation for exploration. Um, 
Yeah, in real world settings, the agent does not have, ac have access to the full state of the world, but instead it receives observations such as images from the camera. This makes exploration much more difficult because it's hard to learn a density model of high dimensional observations. For example, randomly sampling an image in the space of pixels would likely result in a meaningless image. And it's also unclear how to define distances between two images. This motivates why we might want to learn a disentangled representation that breaks down observations into semantically meaningful dimensions, uh, such as um, robot and effector position, the shape, sizes, and colors of different objects in the scene, the lighting condition of the room, and etc. This disentangled representation can be very helpful for the agent to figure out how its actions affect the state of the world, and it can also enable human-agent interaction through language. In this section, we'll look at how disentangled representation can benefit RL. Uh, so in our work, we proposed using weak supervision as a scalable way to introduce structure into goal-conditioned RL. The main idea of our work is to use weak supervision to learn a disentangled representation, which is then used to guide exploration and goal generation for RL. Uh, motivation for using weak supervision is that it's easy and intuitive for humans to specify, and it can be scalably collected from non-expert humans through crowdsourcing. This is often much cheaper than uh, obtaining hand-designed effective reward functions. Uh, the disentangled representation allows the agent to focus on exploring along meaningful axes of variation while ignoring state dimensions that do not matter. And ultimately, our approach uh, enables the human user to specify the factors of variation that matter for solving a family of tasks. We evaluated our method on several visual manipulation tasks. And uh, here we show performance on a pickup task where the goal distance measures how close the policy moved the object to the goal position. We plot the performance of prior work which use an unsupervised VAE representation to do goal sampling and define the uh, goal distance function. And the red line uh, is our weekly supervised method. It learns faster than the baselines and achieves better performance at convergence. And across a wide range of tasks, we found that our method consistently outperformed prior methods in both performance and learning speed. And the reason for this gap is that the learned disentangled representation allows the agent to do directed learning that is much more efficient than purely unsupervised exploration. Uh, to summarize, we propose weak supervision as a way to scalably introduce structure into goal condition RL and enable much faster learning. Uh, and uh, the takeaway message of this talk is that combining self-supervised RL with scalable forms of human supervision can make the task much easier to learn. It can greatly accelerate the learning speed, improve generalization performance at test time, and enable better safety and controllability of the exploration during training. And as future work, in order to scale RL to solve real world tasks, I think it's important to think about what are alternative uh, scalable modalities of supervision for RL. We want uh, supervision that is scalable to collect and provides useful learning signals for the agent. This talk addressed uh, uh, different ways to scalably supervise RL agents, but a lot of pieces are still missing. And uh, to wrap up, I'd like to thank my collaborators, and I think I'm out of time, so I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>